Father, we do uh, look forward today to what you're going to teach us. God, I thank you that, uh, Lord, you just raised up men to uh, get down on paper your heart for their generation, which then makes it your heart for our generation. And God, as Paul is writing to this group of believers who, Lord, they're just wanting to follow you, they're wanting to know you more, they're wanting to uh, represent you rightly, I pray that once again, as he shares with them, that it would be something that would go deep in our hearts and, and encourage us and strengthen us. As they deal with issues, Lord, and Paul brings them up, that we would understand that, Lord, we deal with the same stuff. Maybe a different label, but the same stuff. So, God, give us ears to hear. Give our hearts, Lord. Let our hearts be soft and pliable and tender. And I just pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we finished up last time, we were looking at the rapture of the church. And Paul was answering the question, hey, what happens after you die? And I think, listen, I think that's a valid question. People, people all over it want to know, what happens after you die? That's one of the major questions. But another big question is, how is the world going to end? How is all this going to wrap up? Well, Paul's going to answer that part today. So he gives them the first part. Now he's going to answer the second part. And as he does that, Bottom line, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus. And here's what I know from reading my Bible. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back, and we need to understand that. I grew up in a religion that was very, very uh, ritualistic. You did certain things, and it was the Orthodox Church, and my, our, our brand was the Serbian Orthodox, but all Orthodox are the same, just very religious, very rigid, very strict. And no one ever told me that Jesus was coming back. When I got saved, I was a little bit angry, like, you might have mentioned that. I think it's an important thing that we understand that Jesus is coming back and that, listen, that we get a handle on that. But there are a lot of people who they don't want to talk about those sort of things. They don't want to talk about prophecy or we can even name it, you know, the, the theological term is eschatology. That's a big word that means end times. So listen, a lot of people, I don't like to talk about that. You know, it's kind of, it's hard to understand. It's a little bit freaky and it's a little bit weird and gets a little bit mystical and I'm not sure I want to understand. A lot of those excuses come from not being taught well and I think we can understand prophecy. Do you know that over one third of the Bible is prophecy? So I think we should understand it if we're gonna understand our Bible. But do you know that there's, here's some Bible trivia, there's over 1,800 verses that talk about the second coming of Jesus. So I think it's something that we should be able to know if there's 1,800 verses that talk about it, obviously God has given us some revelation about it. And then do you know that there's 17 books in the Old Testament dedicated to the second coming of Jesus? So again, we could, we could read and understand. One more bit of trivia, that uh, there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. This is in case you're playing trivia someplace. But out of that, listen, there are 318 references to the second coming of Jesus. Seven out of every 10 chapters somehow talk about Jesus coming back. So I don't think we should be afraid of it, and I really don't think we should be ignorant of it. We should understand it. So Paul last time laid out for us, hey, everyone is gonna be with Jesus. If you die before he comes, then you're gonna be caught up, and those who are alive will then be caught up after them. So we're all gonna be with Jesus forever, and we're gonna be caught up with him in the clouds, he said. And then he says, comfort one another with these words. Now he continues on, again, a bad chapter break. He continues on, and he says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Here's what Paul's saying. We already talked about that, about the times. And listen, the times can be the chronology is, is what that original word means, and, and seasons kind of mean events, things surrounding it, what's gonna be happening. And here's what Paul said. We already talked about it. Now, does that kind of, it sort of blows my mind. Because these guys, listen, I don't think Paul was in Corinth much more than maybe, you know, I, I stretch it every week. So I'm sorry, not Corinth, Thessalonica. I don't think it was there over maybe four months. Like I started out one month, 
I've gone to two months. Now I've gone to four months. So I'm trying to be generous. When you disciple somebody, and hopefully you do do that, if you get a new believer, is that the first thing you talk about is the second coming of Jesus and, and those events? Obviously, Paul did. He thought it was important enough for that church to talk to him about it. So here's what he says. But concerning that stuff, I don't need to write to you. Now, also, we need to understand something. Paul's not so concerned with dates. Paul's concerned with how do we live as we, uh, because we know this truth. How is this truth going to affect the way we live? So he said, listen, he says, I have no need to, he says, because of the times and the seasons, brethren, I have no need, to, the, the, no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Oh. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Have you ever noticed that thieves usually don't like send out text messages? Like, hey, could you go out to dinner? I'm planning on robbing your house, and I'd really like for you to step out for a few hours and, you know, come back after two hours, I'll be done. I should be able to get it wiped out. Usually they don't send text messages, right? A thief, what? We don't know when they're coming, or if we knew when they were coming, we would do something about it, right? Whenever I think of this line, this passage, do you guys ever, like, I get all kinds. Do you guys get scam text messages, like spam I get one, I've gotten one three times, same one, from the Border Patrol. This is weird. I get a text message from the Border Patrol that they confiscated my package that was full of narcotics, and they have confiscated it, and I need to report because they have a warrant out for my arrest, and if I do not take care of that, they're going to issue another warrant. Really? Like, like... The Border Patrol is going to text you ahead of time, we're coming to arrest you. Like, that's just like, who falls for that stuff? Like, I, every time I read that, I think, seriously? But part of me does want to call. Because here's what I'm thinking. You guys are so crazy. I want to find out who's doing this, right? But listen, and I get those, I get those texts. Those aren't, those aren't calls. Those are texts. And it always cracks me up. So listen. Jesus is gonna come, that has nothing to do with what we're doing other than the thief in the night. Listen, he's coming, he's coming as a thief in the night. Now, something we need to know is now Paul, listen, now Paul has declared that the day of the Lord is imminent. The day of the Lord can start at any moment. By the way, you should know the day of the Lord's not a 24 hour period. The day of the Lord is when God brings his judgment on this planet for the sins that have been committed. And something we all need to realize from this passage, God is going to pour out his wrath for the sins that are committed. He is going to judge this planet. The Bible tells us that. Here's some passages that you can look up. Isaiah, Amos, Joel, Zephaniah, and there's others. I just listed these that you can look at real fast and talk about the day of the Lord. So listen, the day of the Lord is eminent. He says it could show up at any moment, but then he's just now told us also that Jesus could come for us, for the church, and rapture the church at any moment. So what does that mean? Listen, they, they both can't be eminent unless they're tied together, right? If the day of the Lord happens before Jesus comes for his church, then that's not eminent. The day of the Lord has to happen, then the other. Or flip it around. So what is he telling us? Here's what he's telling us. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. The church is taken out, and then there's that phenomenon, the day of the Lord or the 70th week of Daniel, or the tribulation, whatever term you wanna put, it's funny, because some people tell me, well, you know, it's really not the tribulation. I go, okay, then we'll call it the 70th week of Daniel. You know, people like crack me up. They always like, wanna get so nitpicky, and I, I don't care what you call it, God is going to judge this planet, and he's going to pour out his wrath for the sin that has been committed. But at the same time as he's judging the planet, one other thing is going on simultaneous during that seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel. When the Lord speaks to Daniel, here's what he says. 
There has been appointed for you and your people. Who's Daniel's people? Jews, right? His peeps are the Jews. He's Jewish. So he says, listen, this is appointed for you and your people to take place. Jeremiah calls this same thing the day of the Lord. He calls it Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Israel, right? So that seven-year period, listen, that seven-year period, not only is God pouring out his wrath, God is working in such a way to bring Israel to the point where they will return repent and according to Zechariah they're going to look on him who they pierce and they will all turn to the Lord so not only is it a judgment uh, and pouring out his wrath he's bringing Israel to himself and he's working that and hence the time of Jacob's trouble so that's what the day of the Lord is and here's what here's what he says that can happen at any moment it's going to happen like that it's going to come like that now verses one and two he uses a second person pronoun, right? He says you, right? Not your heads. Just pretend like, like we're doing the same thing. Hey, he says, listen, he says for you, right? He says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need, verse two, for you yourselves know perfectly what's going to happen. Now check out what happens in verse three, because this is important. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. What happened? He went from second person to third person. In other words, he's talking about the church in one and two. He's talking about somebody else in verse three because he says they, not you. And here's what he's saying, man. That is gonna happen and here's what he's telling us. When the day of the Lord begins, here's what they are gonna say, the world. Oh, it's so nice, it's so peaceful. You know the New Agers, coming from Bisbee, I have some insight. The New Agers say this. This is incredible. It's incredible what people come up with. The New Agers say, when Mother Earth gets tired of Christians, Mother Earth is gonna spew us off this planet. Hence the rapture. They got an answer for it already, right? So kind of think about that. Like think about, listen then, think about that. So here's what's gonna happen. The Christians are gonna be gone. People are gonna go, yes, we got rid of those people, yes. And then there's gonna be this guy called the Antichrist who brings peace. And everybody's gonna be happy and they're gonna say peace and safety, especially the nation of Israel. Why? He makes a treaty with Israel. He makes a seven-year treaty. And in the middle of that seven-year period, he breaks the treaty, sets himself up as God, and that's a whole, th- whole different study. But here's, here's my point. The Antichrist has to be revealed when the day of the Lord begins, and the world will say peace and safety, but all the time God is bringing his wrath and destruction is coming, and the wrath of God is coming. That should scare us. Not scare us for ourselves, scare us for the world around us. We should be concerned about that, and that's gonna happen. So sometimes, you know, recently some people have asked me, hey, Pat, do you think the tribulation has begun because of what we're going through? I have read the Bible, and especially, you know, just just for homework, read read Revelation chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. But you begin reading that, listen, when God's wrath is poured out, even in the very beginning, when Jesus begins to open the seals, and he opens seven seals, and as you read through those, and destruction and death and and chaos comes to this planet, listen carefully. We haven't even begun to see what's talked about in Revelation. We have this thing called a pandemic. It's nothing close to what's going on. Yeah, we've had some, some... horrendous storms coming and things seem to be increasing in intensity. It's still not what he's talking about. So when people say, hey Pat, do you think we're kind of, and someone asked me, do you think we're like, you know, maybe like halfway through the halfway, so like a quarter into the, into the seven year period? I go, no, I know we're not. And they go, how, do you, how can you be so sure? Number one, I'm still here. <laughs> Number two, Number two is the Antichrist has not been revealed. 
Number three, there's not been a, a, a peace treaty with Israel. And number four, there's not world peace. Have you noticed there's like, everybody's not getting along singing Kumbaya? Listen, that, all that's gonna happen. So here's what he's saying. The world is gonna say, peace and safety. But sudden destruction is coming on them. And listen to the last part, because I think this is important. He says, listen, and they shall not escape. There's no way out. When God begins to pour out out his wrath, there's no way out. And then, look at verse four, but you, oh, now he's changing back to brethren, right? Are you kind of paying attention? Hey, all the way through the rest of this letter and the second letter to Thessalonians, Pay attention to the pronouns because it means something. He's changing who he's talking to. So now he's back to us, right? He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. Here's what he's saying. We're not in a darkness. We have light. What light do we have? God's revelation, his word. He's given us his word. We don't have to walk around fumbling and bumbling. We have his word. So he says, hey, hey, you guys, You're not in the darkness, so this day shouldn't freak you out. Now listen, it still doesn't mean, I think Jesus is gonna come. I think he's gonna come suddenly. And last week we talked about it's gonna be really loud. It's not gonna be like a secret thing. And we're gonna shoot off of here. The new agers are gonna dance and be happy, but we don't care because we're gonna be gone. And listen, we're gonna be gone, but it's, listen, it's not gonna be something like we're gonna be bummed about it. We get to go be with Jesus forever. And he says, so you guys who are of the light, listen, you guys who are of the day, he says, of the light, this day should not overtake you as a thief. Verse five, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. I guess I have to say sons and daughters, right? God, I don't want to get canceled by our culture, right? So let's do the whole gender thing and, and, and sons and daughters or it's. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. So, listen. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Here's what he's saying. We walk in light. And I want us to understand this. He's trying to tell us who we are. As believers, we're children of the light. We're children of the day. But here's what happens. We kind of go over here in the shadows and we go, well, I'm trying to get in the shadow. We go over here. We go over and we go, I want to get in the shadow because it's so tempting. And we kind of scooch over into the shadow. What are you doing in the shadows? Do you know what happens when you get in the shadows? You get a little confused. Things aren't as clear. Things begin a little bit murky. And here's what Paul says. We're children of the day. We need to be out in the daylight. Hey, when sin happens in your life, not if, when, When sin happens in your life, bring it out in the light. Don't put it in the shadows. In the shadows, you're gonna get really messed up, man, and it's not gonna get fixed. It's gonna fester and grow, and it's gonna work on you. Get out in the light. He says, we're children of the day. Do you remember when you read in Genesis, Adam and Eve, you read that story, I'm always intrigued by that. And you know, I, you know, you try and speculate, you try and read things. Like, I'm always intrigued by the fact that she had a conversation with the serpent. I'm just intrigued by that. I mean, did all the animals talk? Listen, if a serpent came up to me and said, hey, Pat, how's it going? I would be a little shocked. I mean, I'd be thinking, why is a snake talking to me? But she has this long conversation, right? You can read it, it's a long conversation. And he deceives her. Right, she starts out kind of good and then she starts like, you know, faltering and kind of buying into the lie and then she eats the fruit, bummer. Now, a lot of people get mad at Eve. Eve was deceived. Adam, he was just a dork. Because she just said, here, eat, and he goes, okay. And he just ate. Like, Adam, I'm thinking, you're such a dork, man. Number one, you should be leading your family, not following. And you should be in that place where you're doing those things. And I can preach all day at Adam, but I'm sure, according to my understanding of Scripture, had I been there, I would have ate too. But listen, man, he eats. And then after they eat of the fruit, do you remember what happened? Not not just the, they knew they were naked in the clothes thing and the fig leaves and all that stuff. But do you remember where they ended up? Where'd they end up? In the shadows, right? They got in the shadows. That's what we tend to do. We sin and we try and get in the shadows and they're like 
I'm gonna hide from God. Do you know something? God can find you in the shadows. You're not hiding from God, you're kind of hiding from reality. And do you remember, I always love that scene, remember God says, Adam, where are you? He wasn't asking Adam where he physically was, like it's not like God lost Adam. Like, I knew I put two people down there and I can't find them anymore, where'd they go? He was saying, God, where are you, or Adam, where are you spiritually? What just happened? What took place? And finally they come out in the light. But listen to what they, listen to what they gave up, man. They were hanging out with God. They were walking with God every day. Wouldn't that be good just to get up in the morning and walk with God? And, and, and I, know, I know we can do it by faith, but I'm talking about for reals. And so they gave that up, and here's what he's telling you and I. We have that advantage of being in the light don't go into darkness. Why would we do that? So here's what I'm beginning to understand from what he's writing. There are people who live in the light and there are people who live in the dark. You know, culture or right now, they're trying to, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, all, we're trying to make peace with all the races, with all the ethnicities, all of these things. We're trying to, like, it, it, some of it just like drives me bonkers, you know? It's just like, really? Listen carefully, there's only two kinds of humans, those in the dark and those in the light. Those who are born again, those who are not. Those who believe, those who don't. That's the only kind of humans there are. Everybody falls in one of those two camps. And so here's what he's saying, don't be, like, don't be in the dark, right? And some of us are going, yeah, I got that. Oh, well, let's go a little bit further. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, here's what I like. Paul's kind of including himself, right? He's saying us. And he's saying to us, listen, let's don't sleep. Let's don't sleep like the people who are in the dark do. Let's not do that. Let us watch and be sober, be vigilant. When he's talking about being sober, he's not talking about, you know, we need to abstain from alcoholic beverages. He's saying we need to be some people who we're serious about what's going on, that we have an understanding that God is going to come and judge this planet, and you and I are responsible to warn the world that this is going to happen, and this is going to take place. Let's be a little bit sober about it let's be some people who we don't just brush it off and oh you know that's going to happen but you know turn or burn kind of thing and and we do that no let's be sober about it and let's be watchful and let's not sleep you guys taking any naps we kind of tend to do that don't we we kind of tend to snooze off do you remember when Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane I love that whole scene in the Bible, and when we go to Israel, I love the whole scene because we, we find a garden. We don't go to the, the, the one that's all, quote, manufactured in my mind. and think. We find a nice, and it's all full of people. We find a nice little place that's got some olive trees on the side of the Mount of Olives, and we just hang out there, and we pray for a while, and we just hang out with Jesus. But remember when he went in there? Remember he left most of the disciples outside, and who'd he take with him? The boys, right? Peter, James, and John, man, they did everything right. And remember they went in and Jesus said, hey guys, I'm gonna go over there and pray, but you stay here and watch. And what happened? (sighs) Now we like to get on them and blame them, but listen carefully, man, they just had a big old honking meal. Right? They just ate a bunch of lamb. They had some good pita. They had hummus. They had all of the good stuff. You, you know, you, you think of those good Mediterranean dishes and, and you're going, yeah. And they, can, they all just ate. What happens when you eat a big meal? And Jesus came and said, watch. And he came back to him three times and he finally said, just sleep. <laughs> We're not supposed to be doing that. We don't sleep as the world does. Listen carefully, we don't ignore these things that are surely gonna happen because they are gonna take place and we need to be people who are sober about it and we have an understanding. And then he says, listen, he just, he relates it and again, I don't think he's just talking about alcohol. He says, look at verse seven, for those, now who's he talking about? Notice he changed again, for those, right? For those who sleep, sleep at night and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So again, I don't think he's just talking about alcoholic things. Here's what he's saying. 
the world lives in this space, we should be living in this space. Here's what Paul is calling them to and calling us to, a life that is paying attention spiritually to what is going on. And we're walking in the spirit. Listen, walking in the spirit doesn't mean you like levitate and walk three feet off the ground and I'm in the spirit. Walking in the spirit means I'm looking at things from a spiritual perspective. And I'm trying to get God's eyes and God's heart for what's going on. So he says, listen, we don't, here's what he's saying. We don't live like the world lives. Or do we? Good question, isn't it? Hey, you can answer that. Are you tied into this world? Or are you looking forward to his coming? You know, it's funny. Some people I've talked to and they go, well, you know, I really don't want him to come right now. And I go, really? So when's your timetable? Like, what would be convenient for you? I'm sure Jesus would like to know because he wants to do things according. Come on, what do you mean you don't want him to come right now? Well, I'm about to get married and I really want to get married first. <laughs> Seriously? Like marriage, eternity. Hmm, I'm going for eternity, right? And yet I understand, listen, and that's just the thing. See, that person, they're taking a little nap. They're sleeping a little bit, they're snoozing. Why? Because they've lost focus and they've lost what's going on. Doesn't mean they're not going to heaven. We're gonna find that out in a minute. But listen, they do that. So he says, don't do, don't live like the world. So he says, those uh, who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night, but let us who are of the day be sober. Let us be sober. Listen, have you ever noticed what happens in the dark in our world? Have you ever paid attention? Gaynell and I, years ago, we went to New Orleans. We were just driving through. And it was like two in the afternoon. So we went to Bourbon Street. And we went and got a good sandwich and stuff. It was fun. But the sun went down. Oh, my word. When the sun went down, I thought, listen, I'm from Bisbee. Like, I know funk. I know immorality. I know stuff that goes on. I have never seen something like that. People do what they do in the dark. Do you ever, have you ever rented kind of a skanking motel room, I guess is the way we would put it? Have you ever rented one of those cheaper places and turned on the lights? Have you ever noticed what happens when you turn on the lights in those places? The floor moves. Brrr, like all the roaches take off. We were, in, we, were, we were in Mexico one time and we rented this place. We went to a really nice hotel, but we were all funky because we'd been up in the mountains. And I'm not exaggerating, the guy at the front desk said, no, you cannot get a room here. You go down there. So we went down there and we got a room. I paid, I paid $11 for this room. We went and Gainel goes, I am not staying in this room. I go, oh yeah, you are. We paid 11 bucks, man, we're staying. We're staying, and she goes, and we went and checked it out, and the floor didn't move too much, and she's going, <laughs> anyway, it's a long story. Ask her about it. They short-sheeted the bed. It was just like a mess, but I got my $11 worth. <laughs> Do you hear what he's saying? Don't be like that. Don't be those people who are hanging out in the dark. Bad things happen in the dark. Confusion happens. We get to the place where we're not trusting Jesus anymore and we start trusting ourselves. We get to the place where we start doubting everything about him. So here's what he says. Listen, he says, we are not those, but let us, uh, in verse eight, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Huh, does that sound a little bit familiar? Sounds a little bit familiar with Ephesians, right? But in Ephesians, the breastplate is something else, and people get all like all freaked out. Well, how come Paul didn't say it right here? And blah, blah, blah. Listen, he's not trying to describe exactly what pieces of armor are. Here's what he's saying. Soldiers are prepared for what's coming. And he's saying, we, as believers, we prepare ourselves for what is coming. And a breastplate does what? It's like today's modern flat, you know, we get flat jackets. You put it on to protect those vital areas, right? And we put on, listen, 
We put on faith and love as a protection of what's going on. What is faith? I have faith in God. I believe God. I believe God's promises. I believe God's predictions. I believe that God is in charge of this world. I believe he has an end result coming. I believe he hasn't given up his authority at all. I put on that breastplate of faith and love as I begin to trust God and believe in God. Guess what? I can love people. I can even love funky people. Right? Why? Because I have this relationship with God. And I believe, listen, I believe this breastplate of, of love and uh, faith and love come from putting on my helmet that is a hope of salvation. Huh. Because I know God is going to save me. I know these other things. And I begin to, even sometimes you can work backwards. Just work backwards from the cross. Did the cross really happen? Did Jesus really die on the cross? Yeah, did he rise again on the third day? Absolutely, and you begin to work backwards and you get, yes, and you get stronger in your faith. Now, if you've been coming on Thursday night and if you were here Thursday, here's an interesting thing. We started the book of Colossians. What did Paul say in the book of Colossians for those of you who are here Thursday? Some of you are going, oh, I don't remember. Here's what he says. These three, faith, love, and hope. Huh. Well, he says it in Colossians. He says it in Thessalonians. He even says it in Corinthians, right? What do we have? He kind of different, different order. And the greatest of these, he says, is love. But listen, listen carefully. Are you kind of getting the idea that the bedrock of our belief system is faith, love, and hope? comes up three those three things come up over and over so he says listen we put those on i love this he says listen we put those on for verse nine god did not appoint us to wrath underline that especially if you're a post-tribber you got to read this and you got to deal with it because that seven year period is god pouring out his wrath and here he tells me god did not appoint me to wrath hallelujah huh Listen, that doesn't mean, because I know some people go, yeah, you pre-tribbers, you just want to escape, you know, difficulties. My Bible says this. Everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Persecution and God's wrath are two different things. Trials from the world and God's wrath are two different things. God's wrath is God judging sin. By the way, God's wrath isn't like he gets so fed up he just flies off the handle. Sometimes when we think of wrath, we think of somebody going, Wah! it's God judging and bringing what people have deserved. So, so keep that in mind, but here's what he says. God has not appointed us to wrath. Listen, now let's read the rest of it because I think it's important. God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Oh, oh. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, what does he say? We're appointed to what? Salvation. We're appointed to eternity. We have an appointment and God did it when? When did God do it? Listen carefully, he didn't do it when you believed, he did it when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus died for your sins. And when we talk about that, listen, we're not just talking about the physical death. Most of us kind of get a handle on, on the physical death of Jesus. But do you know when he was on the cross that he took the wrath of God that you deserve, that I deserve, and he took it upon himself? And he took, he suffered the eternal wrath of God that I deserve for eternity, that every human being deserves for eternity. And he took it, and he took it upon himself in a moment, in an instant of time. How did he do that? Well, that's why he had to be God. Because only God can go outside of time and space and take care of that for us. So our wrath was paid for. This is why we're not appointed to wrath. It's already been paid for, and God's not gonna put his wrath on, number one, on somebody who's clear of wrath, nor is he gonna put his wrath on his own son because he's already done that. And if you're born again, you're in Christ. So he says, listen, the salvation, and then I, I love this whole idea. He says, but we are appointed to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. How do we get our salvation? By going to church? No, we get our salvation, how? Through Jesus Christ who died for us. 
and he brings that out and it's so important that we get a hold of that. Oh, by the way, do you know this is the first time he brought up to this church, the, the church in Thessalonica, that Jesus died for their sins? That's kind of interesting. He's almost done with the letter. Like, that's a long time to go without bringing up the fact. You know what that tells me? Their issue wasn't that they didn't understand salvation. They had a grasp on salvation. They had a handle on it. He didn't have to bring it up because he knew they believed it. But here's what he's letting. Don't get confused about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not for you, it's for the world, it's for the, those in the dark. And then he says, and then he says, listen, he says, for Jesus Christ, or for Jesus Christ who died for us, check this out, verse 10, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You know what my interpretation of that is? You're gonna live with Jesus. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're taking a little nap, he's still gonna take you. I hate it, and I don't, think it's, I don't think it's very popular now. I talked about it last week. There used to be this whole partial rapture theory, like if you were holy enough, God would take you. Now, let's, let's be a little bit honest. If that's true, and God came right now, how many of us would go? Oh, you chickens. <laughs> yeah, we kind of know, right? I mean, I, I, that whole thing, when people try and put those kind of trips on you, here's what you understand. I'm not holy, and I'll never get holy. And then pretty soon you're defeated. And then pretty soon you just you give up on your relationship because you've made it a works thing. Did you hear what he just said? Whether you're awake or sleep, you're gonna go be with Jesus forever. Yes, yes. Now listen, that's not to say go and sin and do whatever you want. Because if you really believe that Jesus is coming and you really believe that the day of the Lord is going to happen, you know that God's wrath is about to be poured out and you have an obligation to this culture or to this, uh, to this generation to let them know that truth. And we need to be sober about it. We need to be real about it. So we need to live a little bit different than the world. And they can call us freaks. And then he says this, verse 11. We kind of did this at the end of last week too. He says, therefore, argue with each other, bite and devour each other, and make sure you're the right one. Because that's what we do. It always cracks me up. Listen, man, he's talking about topics that we want to fight over, we want to argue over, we want to shoot each other over. And listen what he says. He says, what? Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. And here's what I love. Just as you are also doing. Well, this church was doing it. And he's just encouraging them, just keep doing it. We need to be people who we give, listen, we don't need to be fighting and bickering. You don't need to be talk, bad-mouthing people in the church. You don't need to be bad-mouthing what's going on in the church. Nothing breaks my heart more than when I hear from somebody what somebody said about something in the church that they didn't have the courtesy to come and say it to me. It's like, hey, if you got a problem, come and tell me. I'll listen to you. I'm not saying I'm gonna change everything, but I'll listen to you. I might change something. I'm pretty stubborn, but I might. But listen, we need to be comforting one another, not devouring one another, not backbiting one another. We need to comfort one another. And sometimes comforting is pushing each other to go a little bit further. Listen, comforting's not just, oh, poor Besito, let me hug you and and then make sure you're okay. Comforting can mean, hey, you're taking a nap. Wake up. And then edifying. Edifying means this building someone up. Here's a challenge. When was the last time you built up a brother or sister in this fellowship? Because I'm thinking if you're here, if you're visiting, you can ignore me right now. But if you've been coming here for a while, listen, if you've been coming here for a while, this is your your church. When was the last time you built somebody up? You went to him and said, man, you're just such an encouragement. You're so, you're so encouraging to me. I've been watching you. I see how you live. I see what you do. Man, I just want to encourage you. Just keep going, man. Keep growing. Is there something I can do to help you? When was the last time you did that? A little guilt trip. Think about it. Because this is what, listen, this is what Paul says it's all about. Now, the people in Thessalonica, they were doing that. So we should be doing that. So what did we learn today? Hopefully you got this. Jesus is coming, right? Right, you got that. 
And when he comes, God's wrath is gonna begin to be poured out on that generation. And we have an obligation to warn people. He is going to pour out his wrath. Hey, sometimes people say, how come God hasn't judged that yet? Oh, he's going to. Listen, he may not do it according to your timetable, but God is gonna judge it. And you need to understand that. And you also need to understand something. I, I think we should take care of this planet. I've talked about it before. God gave us this planet. We should take care of it, right? Don't trash it. it bugs me when people, oh, you know, some Christians, I don't care. Well, here, but here's what I do know. It's also, it's not gonna last forever. God is gonna destroy this. Whenever, whenever environmentalists and greenie people come to me and start talking all this green stuff, here's what I tell them. It's gonna burn. <laughs> they get all mad. How dare you? I go, hey, let me, let me read it to you. Right here it says it's gonna burn. Just so you know, just so you know, you can't save it. So you can save yourself, but you can't save the planet. And we need to understand that he is coming to judge and you and I have the tremendous privilege to have light in the midst of all of that darkness. Let's stand up and pray. Lord, I, I do thank you just for the challenge we have. And Lord, I know sometimes some of this is hard to hear. We hear these words and, and sometimes it's just like, and, and I know for some of us, we're just going, does it really matter? Obviously it does. If it was on the heart of Paul to get this church ready and they're only four months old in the Lord, it should be the heart of us to make sure our fellowship is a fellowship that is believing that Jesus Christ can come at any moment. There's nothing that has to happen before he comes. And when he comes is the beginning. And the day of the Lord will start. And this planet will be judged. Let us be people who want to scream that from the rooftops. To grab a hold of the world and try and drag them into this thing we call Christianity. Use us, God to bring glory to you. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for a couple more moments. And if you are here today and you've never accepted Jesus, you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, today is the day to do it. Kind of, a, kind of a weird message, maybe a message that even kind of like hits you really hard, like he's really coming back? Yeah, he is. And judgment is really gonna happen. And the only way out of that judgment is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, to get your sin dealt with right now. So here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to admit to God that you know you're a sinner. I don't think that's hard for anybody. I know it's kind of maybe hard to admit it, but we all know, listen, we all know we sin. We don't even need the Bible to tell us that. We know that. But you gotta admit it to God. Not so that God knows, so that he is assured that you're in a place where you know you're, that you've offended a holy and righteous God. And then you have to understand that because of that, you deserve the wrath of God. That's the bad news. The good news is we talked about Jesus Christ took your place. He took your wrath. So all you have to do, he's holding out right now for you, right here in this room. Here is a receipt. Your debt is paid. Paid in full. I've taken care of it. All you have to do is take that from him. Right now, grab it from his hand and you will have this gift of salvation and eternal life. So if you wanna do that, I'm gonna say a prayer. You can say this prayer with me out loud or you can say it silently. Volume doesn't matter, your heart matters. Maybe you're backslidden. Man, if you're backslidden, that means you're hanging out in the shadows or even all the way into the dark. Come home, man, come back to Jesus right now. His arms are open wide, come back to him. If you're watching online, Right now, online, you can say this prayer right where you're at. You don't have to be in this building. Jesus, today I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. 
I'm asking you to come into my life and guide me. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior.